live programming is back, which we uh, love. I have to tell you one quick story. Uh-oh, staff is going to get nervous. I did a, a morning I, a Highgate Senior Living a couple weeks ago for a program. We had not done a, a live program for 14 months at the senior centers. And we had 40 people lined up eager to hear a talk. I, was, I did my presentation called The Railroad Shapes Our Town. Uh, I don't mean to put pressure on you, but 40 people in the audience all spontaneously began, started singing, I've been working on the railroad. <laughs> so I don't know if we want to do Home on the Range or what we want with Barbara today. So uh, I have uh, one other announcement to make. Uh, we, we have been raising uh, support funds to do what's called our landscape project. This is our 50th anniversary as the Western Heritage Center. And we had to raise about $106,000, and we actually reached our goal this year. Just in the last couple months, we've had large donations from Stockman Bank, Western Energy, from the John Jernberg family, and on and on, and, and dozens of other folks. So we hope to break ground to clean up the last vestige of lawn here at the Western Heritage Center uh, in September of this year. So we'll have kind of beautiful patio as we have out in front. We'll stretch it all the way around the back side on the side here. And uh, you'll see that progress as you continue to come to program. So um, I just have a shout out for Lauren Hunley, our community historian who's over there, and Cecilia Gavinsky, our archives uh, collections manager, whatever your title is, sorry. Um, but uh, the two of them were instrumental in working with Barbara Van Cleve uh, to get this exhibit up. Uh, Cecilia hung the exhibit, and I wanted to make sure that Cecilia got a chance to introduce Barbara to you today. So without further ado, Cecilia Gavinsky. Right up out 
outside of Big Timber on the ranch as a family history. Uh, they're doing a documentary on me that's supposed to be a full-length documentary, feature-length, and I am so proud because it's going to bring in all of my family history. Uh, I mean, my great-great-grandmother was the first white woman born west of the Mississippi. She married General Horatio Van Cleef in Fort Snelling, which is now Minneapolis-St. Paul. And there's a lot of history, my family history, to the settling of Montana when it finally became a, uh, a state, not just a territory. At any rate, I got started on this project thanks to my mother. I had finished a story on Johnny Jonkowski you must know her around here. Two-time world champion women's bull rider, and she's from Billings. And I did it for People Magazine. Well, they didn't publish it, and they rejected it. And I really never knew whether it was because I shot in black and white or whether it was just the quality of the story. I never knew. But I was grumbling to my mother about it. And she said, why don't you just shoot ranch women? Well, that led to this project. And fortunately, uh, it was kind of a word of mouth approach in terms of coming to different ranches. I've, I've worked from Canada, not in Canada, but from Canada through the Rocky Mountains to through Texas. Had a little trouble in Texas finding some real ranch women because everybody, they wanted me to go to the wealthy ranchers who just showed top horses but didn't do anything like out there roping, branding, you know, cooking for a crew, none of that kind of thing. So, and then they wanted to have me photograph women ranchers who were raising uh, angora sheep, mohair and things like that. And I said, no, that isn't what I want. So I finally found some Texans in West Texas. At any rate, this is how I came to this subject. And I really have loved it. It was wonderful. I made so many good friends, uh, unfortunately since this, most of the work was done back in the 80s, uh, many of those people have died, unfortunately. But I'm keeping going, staying in touch with the families. And you get, well, one, I'll show you a ranch girl because I brought some of those shots in here too. I thought she was gonna go on ahead and be a veterinarian. She was uh, raised on an outfit up outside of Polson. Um, and last time I checked, she married a ranch boy. They were on the ranch. They had two little girls, and she was teaching them to barrel race. Well, <laughs> we'll see. You know, time passes pretty fast. So let me get started here. One of the things I always said about ranch women is they have the best sense of humor. I think they have to. Here we have Ella Dean Bittner from down outside of Congress, Arizona. <clears throat> Ella Dean bought her cattle out of, tech, out of uh, Mexico. They were pretty skinny, but they were hungry. And brought them up to some pretty good country in, in Arizona, fattened them up, and then sold them. She had a group of uh, uh, Texas, or I mean, uh, Mexican cowboys, vaqueros, who worked for her. But take a look at her belt buckle. Boss. <laughs> what a good nature, boss. Okay. <laughs> and here she is with a couple of her uh, vaqueros there. Now this is a woman, I love this shot. It's a lucky shot. I get those every so often. I'm a black and white photographer, 
I always felt color was very seductive, kind of like, well, very seductive. And I liked black and white because you could concentrate on composition and design. Color led you astray. That was the problem. This is Fern Sawyer from down outside of uh, New Mexico, the eastern part of New Mexico. She's a real hand. You can see the calf had just been roped. He's in the air all four feet or off the ground because he felt that rope around his neck. Now, was Fern watching? No, Fern knew she was going to catch him. She's a heck of a hand. So you look at her hand. Sorry. I'll get the hang of this. Her hand is still out from having thrown the rope like that. She's headed to the fire. Just going to drag that calf over to the wrestlers and let them throw him a brand new one and the rest of it. Uh, she was quite a hand. This also is in Texas. Uh, a young woman here, this is uh, south of a little town. It's in West Texas. And uh, uh, they have a problem there with wild pigs that are just really pretty mean. And there's a problem with the feed and with the cattle, with these wild hogs. So there was a lot of hunting to kill them all. Uh, this young woman, uh, I saw her two years ago. I couldn't believe it when I made this shot. This was in the 80s. I think it was 1988. Uh, she's just a young woman, newly married, pregnant, and when I saw her two years ago, boy, was there a difference. It was a seasoned ranch woman who's used to working outside, doing all kinds of ranch work, uh, all kinds of ranch work. And uh, she must have been, I'm gonna guess probably how many years ago was that? 40, 50. She had a few years on her, so she's really seasoned. But it was beautiful to see. This is a ranch woman from northern New Mexico. I spent a number of years in Santa Fe building my career as a photographer. Unfortunately, at that time, Montana was not the place to build a career as a photographer, or really even as an artist. It is today, fortunately. Um, but at that time, it wasn't. <clears throat> and so I was in Santa Fe, which was a mecca for photographers, particularly black and white photographers. And uh, this woman, uh, Gretchen Samus, had a ranch uh, outside of Cimarron, New Mexico. She was a worker now, no two ways about that. There she is, uh, just stopping for lunch. Now, I photographed this because, let's hope I hit the right button. Oh. You think I could do this? <sighs> at any rate, look at the stove on the left. I mean, on the right, the old wood burning stove, and there is a partial pot of coffee there. Which, if you know anything about ranch life, you would say, oh, well, she must have started that stove, heat up the kitchen, make the pot of coffee. But then she came back in from being outside working cattle, uh, and she's fixing lunch. She's got the electric oven door open, probably a cheese sandwich or something in there, and then uh, a uh, little uh, pot on top of the stove. She's obviously heating some soup. 
until it's lunch. But it's also uh, pay attention to Gretchen. She was a very uh, knowledgeable rancher. She was very much involved with all the ag organizations in northern New Mexico around Cimarron and that area. Our own Jane Glenning from up outside of uh, Harleton. And Jane, to, to me, this is just a wonderful picture of what most ranch women's life is. A lot of paper that you have to take care of. There's so much government stuff, or as Poco says, gum mint. <laughs> and I think there's some truth in that. Uh, Jane is no longer with us, but I love the fact that she's got a saddle in the background there. <coughs> a new saddle. I want to take good care of it. And this woman uh, was photographed outside of uh, northern Colorado. She now lives with her husband, Bronk, uh, not too far from Heisham, Montana, on the uh, Yellowstone River. She's, you know, I'm fascinated. I have never sold one of these photographs of ranch women. And yet, I know people who photograph old, dirty cowboys, hired hands, all messy and just fouled up, and they got a knife because they've been castrating calves at the branding. And people will buy those, but they won't buy something that shows a young woman here who could run any piece of machinery on the ranch she did. But she loved teams of horses, and she had two teams that she used all the time. Well, I grew up on the ranch, and it was early enough or long enough ago where we put up hay with teams. It was pretty exciting every so often because my granddad didn't believe in really breaking them fully to uh, pull a mower. Buckery. He said, oh, they'll learn in time. Yeah, I betcha. <laughs> but in the meantime, a lot of people had some pretty wild rides with those, <laughs> with those horses and that piece of machinery. I remember one day, you know, the seat on the mower, <laughs> the mower sat up real high, and there was really nothing except what you did to raise the mowing arm. And oh, this young horse and my granddad got a little excited on account of a jackrabbit flew up, not flew up, but jumped up between his legs. And away he went. And the guy on top just finally bailed out because he figured it'd be safer to be off than to be on. And that horse went around this huge field and the sickle bar up and down and up and down. And I thought, boy, I hope all those rabbits and everything else is out of the way because they're going to be maimed if they aren't. <laughs> it was very exciting and teams were wonderful. If any of you have read my dad's books, 40 Years Gatherings or Day Late and a Dollar Short, well, in 40 Years Gatherings, there's a real tearjerker of a story called Cody and Terry. It's about a workhorse team. It's true. But have a box of Kleenex when you read it. That's all I can say. Jane Glenny again. You know, she's prepared. She's not fancy. Most ranch women are not fancy when they're dressed for cold weather, for doing the work. You put on what you've got, as long as it still does the job, and you're using it. <clears throat> this is Melody Harding, the young woman I showed you earlier. And this is her team, uh, Muff and Miff, I think she called them. And uh, it's
it's not a sleigh. You can see the tires on this wagon, but she's feeding using a wagon. And uh, I know my mother used to drive the team for my dad when he was feeding. She loved driving the team. And my mother was uh, uh, a kind of a city girl. She was raised in Harleton. She knows the size of it. Okay, okay. <laughs> but as Dad said, when he married her, she couldn't even boil an egg. So, but she learned, I'll tell you. She was the best cook of game. She just was a wonderful cook, but I think she learned from my dad. And the story goes, my dad met her. She was, had a group of Girl Scout kids up at uh, Half Moon Park in Big Timber Canyon in the Crazies. And she was backing out of a tent. And my dad was there on horseback. And so he kind of sat there with his arms folded across the saddle horn. And she got out of the tent, turned around and looked at him and said, what? And he said, I just wanted to see if the front end looked as good as the back end. <laughs> <laughs> now that's the first time he met her, or the first time she met him. Mother was long suffering. <laughs> it was okay, dad was great though. <laughs> Here is Melody again using a backhoe, and her hired man is helping her in some way with the bucket, but she could use any piece of machinery, and I admire that because I never learned how to use all the big machinery on the ranch. My granddad knew how to use, he was a heck of a horseman. But he knew how to use all the cats he had on the ranch to move the snow, make sure he could get the feed to the sheep, open it up enough. And uh, a lot of ranches were built on sheep. You had two, usually twins. You got two shearings. Oh, you didn't have that with cattle. But when cattle prices were down, sheep were up. And when sheep were down, prices were down, cattle were up. So a lot of ranches, good ranches today, were built on sheep. And now they've moved to cattle and they don't want to talk about sheep. I don't quite understand that, but, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. Old time milk separator. When I was doing this project, I think I had, <coughs> excuse me, 50 women. Only two of them, three of them, had milk cows. I was stunned. I thought everybody had a milk cow, but that isn't true anymore. It's just a little too easy to hop in the truck and or send the kids or when you go pick them up from high school or whatever, you can get your milk at the store. But we milk cows. My brother and I milked them. My mother said she was never going to learn to milk cows or your father wouldn't get home from getting parts in town. <laughs> so mother didn't milk, but we did. Uh, and of course, it, it's, uh, I love just fresh milk. The heck with the pasteurized stuff. It's much better just out of the cow. It, really, it is. I think it's healthier for you, too. Now, this deals with an angle in shooting. When somebody is short, and I know all about that, it helps if your photograph, if somebody photographs you from a low angle because it makes you appear taller. Now this woman, not only was short, she was a lawyer, she specialized in land and water rights, and she was a member of the family of the well-known CS Ranch in northern New Mexico. Boy, 
doesn't everybody want a lawyer in the family if you're a rancher who specializes in land and water rights? You betcha. This is another member of the family, a younger one, who was training the horse part of the operation. And they raised a number of horses. It was a quarter horse thoroughbred cross called an appendix. There was a lot of horse racing in New Mexico at that time. So uh, they were raising and selling horses for that particular purpose. And she was helping to train them from the get-go. Another important thing to me was always to make clear that these women were mothers when they were mothers. And what you had, what I grew up with, well, those who have babies had to stop, take a, take a break and nurse the baby, uh, do whatever had to be done. Now, this young woman was a crackerjack roper in the family, and they had her roping all the time at the brandings. They had a large ranch, and they branded, I don't know how many days a week, maybe a couple, no more than that, but they branded for a full month. And uh, she was originally from Georgia. Uh, they were uh, selling trained horses, and they came out to see the Davis family who owned the C.S. Ranch. And then this young woman met the oldest son of the Davis family, and they fell in love and married. And now, you know the picture I showed you of Kim, who was training the horse with the big tires on either side? Well, one of her daughters, is all grown up now and met a young man who was working on the ranch. Now they're married. Now they've got children. And I've got to get down there and photograph that because that brings us several generations away. And what I wanted to see and make clear to people who saw the photographs is that it is a tradition that is passed down in families. I know it's changed a little bit. It's not so much of a horse operation as it was when I was growing up. Rip, rip, splash. <laughs> I mean, I just can't stand it when my nephews are out there with ATVs. Oh, and I said to them, why are you guys not using horses. I said, your dad, your grandfather and great-grandfather would be rolling over in their graves about this. Well, we save a lot of time. And I said, what are you doing with that extra time? <laughs> I didn't get an answer, so I, I call that kind of a, just a standoff there, I guess. <laughs> I really like this shot. To me, this epitomizes the whole notion of hard twists, because the old time lariat rope was twisted vanilla. It was wet when it was really, really, really tightly twisted and left twisted out to dry, so it stayed that way. It could be broken, but usually it would kind of stretch. And to me, that was very much the way these ranch women are. Small, tightly twisted, hard workers, uh, but they would never break down. In so many cases, uh, women are the ones who have kind of held the ranch together when there's been some sort of an accident or a serious illness. Uh, of the husband or the father or the brother on the ranch. And the women, well, God made us to carry children for nine months, for heaven's sakes, then nurse them for how much longer, 
and then kind of help them grow up. I tell you, I think women are really stronger than many of them have been given credit for. I always thought the Victorians, my academic specialty is Victorian poetry. I love poetry. I love words. Words make pictures. I love pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and Victorians had it, they put women on a pedestal so tall that they couldn't get off, so it kind of handicapped them a little bit. They were beautiful, but they were on top of that pedestal, so they couldn't really make much difference, so the men thought. I'm not bashing <coughs> you men. I don't want to do that. <laughs> but I do think the treatment of women was unfair in that time, and I think to overlook the what the contributions were of women ranchers has been uh, has been bad to put it nicely, just bad. So I hope when people see these pictures of women ranchers, they will realize what they have done and. How good natured they can be about it. If you saw Ella Dean in that first photograph laughing happily, they all laugh. They all have a good sense of humor. And so here we see this hand. She's got a little knot in her reins, so if she drops them, it'll only the reins will only fall on the neck of the horse, not on the ground. And uh, it's clear it's a woman's hand with the um, shirt, the blouse you see too. But nobody ever responded to that picture the way I did. So that tells me a lot about uh, my weakness in terms of this project and how other people feel about it or respond to it. I learned a lot about how people ranch differently. I didn't think there were any differences. I thought we all just roped calves, necked them when they were big, and later in the summer, and uh, headed and healed them to brand. But I discovered this down in central New Mexico. They would, there would be about Oh, five people roping, and they would, there might even be 10 people roping. They'd all rope a calf. There were wrestlers on the ground who would then tie that calf, tie all four feet of the calf down with a pig and string. And then everybody would get off their horses and they would go through those down calves just like, a, like they were on an assembly line. They earmark them, dehorn them, brand them, castrate them, vaccinate them, whatever had to be done. Then they'd undo it and let them get up. Then the ropers would climb back on their horses, do it all over again. And I thought maybe that's how they moved into rodeo where they were roping calves and then just tying them down or even in the old days, team roping. Today it's just called, or team tying. Today it's called team roping because they don't get off and tie the uh, cow down anymore. Don't know why. Here's a case of a young woman and her father who was, was a veterinarian. This is a cow that's had a prolapsed uterus, which means she expelled the uterus during calving when she took some extreme effort to uh, calve. And so the father is showing the daughter how to doctor this cow, clean the uterus, put it back in, and then sew it tight so it can't be expelled again but it was sewn with cat gut so that would dissolve in time and not have to be removed. 
uh, lots of things. <laughs> Here's a gal, a wonderful ranch woman down Colorado, four children, she and her husband. She could swear like a trooper. <laughs> <laughs> but she also had the best sense of humor, and it, it was just, she said she had her own priest, too. She was, <laughs> she was a passionate Catholic, and here you see the rosary wrapped around the saddle horn. Well, she said her grandmother rode in that same country and lost something like uh, 30 different rosaries that just came off and scattered around the country. But you know, um, a lot of people have died when for one reason or the other, your horse goes over backwards and you are caught. And that saddle horn hits you right in the solar plexus and can so damage you, you'll die. Or you'll die right then and there and not have to wait. So in many ways, this rosary with the cross has an awful lot of meanings, I think, for what can happen out on the range with horses, even good horses and good riders. Accidents happen. And <clears throat> I always hated to see chains used when uh, ranchers are pulling calves. Here's a ranch woman who used a rope, and that's what I grew up with when we were pulling calves. We just had a rope, and we're careful with it. But chains, people, a lot of people use chains today, and I just think that, that's pretty tender flesh on that calf. And to put that on and then pull, well, wait a little bit. Let that little heifer try to help you <laughs> before you pull. You know, when she obviously is pushing, then you pull. And this woman was doing a beautiful job. And I like the fact that you can see, I think I'll try this again. Oh. <laughs> no, if I give up. Uh, You can see the cat, the placenta, it's torn, and the calf is able to breathe as it comes out. And you see the whole thing. Now, I use a zoom lens when I'm photographing, because if I use, if I take extra lenses in a saddlebag, by the end of the day, I'm going to have a couple of pieces of glass, some little screws, and some metal stuff. And it didn't take me too long to learn that, that one. So I use a zoom lens. I use a 35 to a 200. Sometimes I'd like the extra length of a 300, but I like the 35, which is approximately how the human eye sees. I have been told. And uh, here, if you look at this little heifer's eyes, I think when you see the print up on the wall, you'll be able to see her eyes. If I had moved closer, she would have gotten up right then and there. And maybe something would have, either she would not have had the calf or she would have expelled the calf so fast it would fall and something would have it would have gotten hurt, perhaps. Um, but I love the shot. It just is about the start of another life, which is a beautiful thing. Many ranchers really feel that way, even though they are raising these calves to go eventually to market. They have to be fattened and, of course, then to market. But they still care about them. And you do your best to make sure those calves can live. 
Now, because I'm short, I learned how to crawl on anything to get extra height. This is in what's known as the Jornada del Muerto, or Journey of Death, area in central New Mexico. It's flat, flat, flat. Uh, and boy, it doesn't have a whole lot of feet. It's got a lot of chamisa, which is very much like our sagebrush here. But uh, I crawled on top of the uh, windmill. Not my favorite place to be, but I'll do anything for a photograph, I'll tell you that. So then I could get a look at the country. We could see that they were using railroad ties for the corrals here. And then you could see this woman rancher in the middle, uh, uh, Jane Kane, and then some other people off to the side. And I do, I, you know, much as I don't like climbing on windmills, I love the results. This is uh, Jane. We just saw her in the corrals. Uh, they had gathered cattle in the morning, just as it was getting light. She's got her shafts on, spurs. You know she was out there working. And then uh, she was also helping to move cattle into onto the scales because they had to weigh them. The, uh, the brand inspector was there. The trucks were there to take the cattle that the buyer wanted. The buyer was there. And then there were neighbors also there to help. So Jane was cooking, another ranch woman. And she had brisket in the oven, though. So she was checking the brisket in the middle of helping outside, too, which is typical. This woman, notice now she's in the back of a pickup. That's pretty close quarters, isn't it? With the horse there, and she's right in there with the horse. And uh, the doll, Chica, is there. Just let me know what you want me to do, and uh, I'll do it. Uh, <clears throat> This is quite a story. This woman had loaded, and she ranched, uh, she and her husband ranched. He was an old time Mustang runner. One of these guys that helped gather Mustangs and wild horses, gather them up and then sell them. And, or maybe somebody would take a look at them, maybe some good bucking stock for a rodeo, uh, something like that. But, uh, she was in an area called Brass Valley, Nevada, which is kind of central Nevada, a little bit to the north, but central Nevada. And it was pretty much surrounded, I guess they call them mountains, I call them hills. And uh, it got cold when the sun set. And uh, this was beautiful country, very good grass country. This is a woman named Molly Knutson. She uh, came from back east. Her father was a military man and she met a rancher back there who was selling horses and she said, well, he was a bachelor when I met him and she, he was a bachelor when I divorced him. <laughs> I guess he really wasn't made for marriage, is what she was saying. And uh, then Molly married this old-time Mustang uh, hunter, Bill, who was a great guy. And uh, the country was such there that the land was eroded. There would be fingers of hard rock and then areas that were soft and it would erode away. I didn't know the country at all. I'd never been in there before. But I was 
gonna photograph on foot. And Molly said, oh no, 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 these cattle are not used to seeing somebody on foot out there. She had two uh, groups of cattle. She had her registered stock and she had her commercial. And this was a day she was going out to gather some of the commercial herd for me to make a photograph. And uh, I was watching her with my long lens, this time not a telephoto, I mean not a zoom lens, but a telephoto 300 millimeter. And I saw Timmy, her horse, come over a hill, go down, and then I saw dust, a lot of dust. And then a little later, I saw Timmy come up and just stand there. And I waited and looked and didn't see any activity at all. And I thought, oh my God, something's happened to Molly. So she was just a little bit of a thing, maybe weighed 89 pounds, fully dressed probably. Um, so I went back, took her pickup, went over as best I could to try and get over there to find her. What I saw was the dog sitting there behind, beside some chemisa, and then I saw a lump, and then I saw her horse, Timmy, who was just standing there with his head down. And I went over, and it was Molly, and she was on the ground, and she said to me, help me up, and she was very demanding, help me up. And I said, Molly, I don't want to touch you because I'm afraid you might be seriously injured and I'd hate to move you and have a broken rib go through a lung or something. And she said, help me up. So went over and very slowly started to raise her back a little bit. She said, oh no, 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 let me put me down. So I had another person with me. We took everything we could to cover her because this was November and it was getting cold. The sun had gone down. So we got everything we could and I left this person with Molly to take care of her and I drove back to the ranch house and called. This was before cell phones many moons ago, and uh, <laughs> it took three hours for the ambulance to get from the town of Austin, Nevada, up to where Molly was to get her. They took her back to Austin. There was a um, helicopter there that then flew her to Reno, to the hospital. Well, I felt so guilty because I was trying to photograph her and she probably wouldn't have been out there doing that that time of day in that area if I hadn't said I want to make a photograph. So I felt guilty. And so I drove to uh, Reno, went to the hospital and uh, found her in the ICU. What had happened is yes, some ribs were broken, but her liver had been pinched like you'd squeeze a grape and then it just lacerated that liver. So it was broken, but she was in good health. And so she didn't die or anything, she was fine. But she was awfully glad I came. And years later, her son said to me after she died, she had macular degeneration and became blind because of that. And he said, did you get a shot of mother when she was with the horse and the dog? And I had to say no, because I would have been forever tempted to use it. And I knew Molly would not have approved of me using it. Her on the ground? For heaven's sakes, helpless? 
for heaven's sakes, not Molly Knudsen. So I just said, no, I'm sorry. But I've always felt bad that I didn't get it. I won't make that mistake twice. <laughs> okay, my current project, it's one take we shot shooting by only the light of the moon. I think I have another, no. I was gonna show you the color one because the digital cameras now shoot everything in color. And by the way, if you wanna shoot black and white, do not do it in the camera. Do not. Go on ahead, shoot it in color, then take the image, put it on your computer, into Photoshop and then make the adjustments in Photoshop to get to black and white. Otherwise you will lose thousands of pixels and you can never get them back. So it will forever damage your original piece. So, uh, but I love this. It <clears throat> An ISO, which means the sensitivity of the camera to light, was about 1200 or 1250, something like that. And then uh, the exposure time had to be about 12 seconds. Well, that's the hard part. A horse is going to switch its tail, bob its head, stamp its foot, the rider is going to breathe, and if it takes, if they take too big a breath, uh, it's going to result in motion. So, uh, I worked and worked and worked on this, and I've now got it pretty well down to what I want. And that happens to be one of my good horses, an appendix quarter horse, quarter horse thoroughbred cross, named Mirabilis. I like the Spanish. Here's another shot up uh, Paradise Valley right into the mountains. It's by moonlight. I tell you, it was so dark, I had to have a flashlight to move around in order to see what I wanted, which was these two ranch gals from Paradise Valley and this pond, and then the reflection of the mountains in the pond, and I call this full moon rising. Well, according to the information on the internet, the moon was supposed to get up at about, I'd say probably 10.30, right about where it's brightest here. Well. It was 1.30, and it was at that time way over to the right. And I thought to myself, I don't think I'm going to shoot any more way up against the mountains because I have to wait too long for the moon to get over the mountains. But I love the shot. How do you like it? Do you like it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Again, it's a long exposure. I think this was about, it was so dark. I think this was about a 20 second exposure. And I told these women, breathe very shallow, please. <laughs> and don't move, and please don't let your horse move if you can help it. So I have a lot of failed shots, but that's okay. As long as I get the one good one, that's what counts. This is a ranch girl uh, on the corner of uh, Colorado, uh, Utah, and Wyoming. And she was working on the ranch. They have three different ranches, not terribly large. One is an in-holding in Dinosaur National Monument. They raise only sheep there. You know what an in-holding is, don't you? It's just privately owned land that is in a 
monument or national park, something like that, that has been there for years and years and years. Uh, and she was running the machinery hay. This is our gal up outside of Polson, Montana, and uh, what I thought was going to be a veterinarian, but is a happy mother, ranch mother now. She's very involved in 4-H, and uh, I remember a lot of 4-H. I had 4-H horses. My dad gave me horses that I had to train and use for my 4-H projects. I, I think 4-H is still pretty uh, alive and well, isn't it today? Here's this young woman again with her brother feeding bum calves. Here's another little gal, uh, now married, the mother of two children, on a ranch with her husband, and uh, I love how that tradition continues. The only thing I don't like about it is how uh, there's more of a reliance on mechanized things or fangs, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> to me, they're fangs. I like the horse operation. But she is learning how to vaccinate the calves here. <laughs> I love this shot <laughs> because look at that lamb that looks like it's going, oh, blessed one, oh, honored one. Yeah, she was trying to break them to train them to lead. Oh, that's a never-ending task. <laughs> Here's another family in Wyoming. Uh, all the children were homeschooled. And uh, you, I walked into the house and was invited to see the schoolroom. And it looked just like the one-room schoolhouse or uh, schoolroom I went to because you had all of the letters of the alphabet across the top and uh, you know you had to practice the curse the Palmer method the, can you believe now people are saying that people are not going to know how to write anymore because of cell phones and everything digital you just I, can't, I just can't believe that. Letter writing has gone to hell in a handbasket, <laughs> I guess. Uh, but here the children are. There were six children at the time I was there, and there have been two more since then when I called to check on the older daughters and see if they're married. Yes, they are. Are married to ranch boys? Yes, they are. Are they ranching? Yes, they are. And here they are. There is the wood burning stove to the extreme left, and then the uh, electric stove there. This family was very self sufficient. I, they only went to town as a family, and mainly where they would go was to the bull ring to, or the sale barn to buy bulls. And it was a big family affair. They all were there, and the kids were learning something about it, too. And uh, I also think uh, dating was pretty uh, inhibited for the girls there because it was a family affair. <clears throat> Here, they're peeling the potatoes that they raised there. When I was there, there was a huge building that the father had piped in water all around it. So this particular barn, the crops in there could be watered all winter long. It was heated. And this is in uh, South Central Wyoming. It got cold. Uh, but they raised all their own food, uh, everything they needed except 
gas, sugar, flour, let's see, what all else was it? A few staples like that where they would have to go to town. I'd never before seen a family who was, uh, who had chosen this kind of life. Completely homeschooled, completely away from town, um, except to go get those things that you could only get in town. This young woman is hooking a rug, a rug, just for cleaning your feet. She did it for uh, every door in the house that led outside. Isn't that a great way to use Balin twine? <laughs> Instead of just having those red things all over the ranch. Uh, she was hooking rugs. But her younger sister in the background with the white container, that was a plastic jar that had been cleaned and it had cream in it. And that young woman would roll that jar back and forth, back and forth. Finally, it would become butter. Just amazing, isn't it? I didn't have that. I had the crank kind. And it just seemed like it took forever until somebody would come in to visit. When somebody was visiting and you were just cranking it, next thing you knew it was butter. Wonderful. Here she's chopping ice for the cattle so that they can get water. She and the rest of the family were out feeding hay. They also fed um, corn, cob corn, as a supplement to the cattle. But they just tossed it on the ground, which surprised me. I thought they would at least have put it in troughs so that the kernels would be saved. Here she's driving the team. Yes, they had teams of horses, too. That's always nice to see. Uh, yeah, and to milk the cow and the kitties, happy as can be. And there are not too many mice around. Huh? Is that the last one? Okay. All right, let me, let me ask you if I provided what you expected at this presentation, or did I fail somewhat? <laughs> because it's very dear to my heart. I couldn't draw, I couldn't paint, and we only had art for a half an hour one day a week in the little two-room schoolhouse, school I went to. And uh, I wanted so badly to communicate to people how wonderful ranking was or is. And, uh, Life magazine came into the house, and I saw all the photographs in there. And W. Eugene uh, Smith did uh, some documentary photographs. Maybe some of you remember the damage done to the Japanese children from the mercury in Miramata, Japan. There, there were children that were horribly contorted because of this poisoning. And he also did a wonderful series, documentary again, on uh, a Kentucky midwife. And I thought, gosh, I could use a camera. And I asked my mother shortly before she died, I said, Mom, why don't you and Dad give me a camera? I thought, talk about 
I thought she was going to say, because we wanted to harness your creative instincts. <laughs> you know what she said? Because you begged for it. <laughs> so much for that. But I did beg for it. And then a year later, they gave me a home developing kit, and I was off and running. I'm basically a self-taught photographer, takes a lot of time, but you never forget the mistakes you learn, because you learn. A, a mistake is not a failure. You learn, and that is not a failure. That's so positive. But I love photography, but I'm telling you, I have to pedal just as hard as I can these days to stay abreast of all of the changes in the, in the digital world. That is a little bit challenging for me. I'm technically challenged. But anything in order to photograph what I want to photograph. Thank you all for coming and sharing this with me. I appreciate it. I'm going to be here. Um, and if you want to ask me questions or you want to take me to any photographs and ask about those, I'll be happy to do that. I brought some books, the Hard Twist book, which is of women ranchers, not ranch girls, but women ranchers. Uh, that's here, will be available at the store here. Thank you so much.